Hey there, welcome to another episode of Savor Food and Body. Today we have Dr. Caitlin O'Connor back on the podcast. You may remember her from a few weeks ago as we were talking about perimenopause and weight gain. And today we are going to kind of continue our conversation into midlife health, talking about sleep quality and how can we support good sleep quality after 40 and during perimenopause. And this is actually going to be a two-part series. So we're going to focus on sleep first, and then we're going to move into talking about some botanical medicine, which I think you'll all find really interesting for supporting just women's health and perimenopause symptoms in general. Um, As a reminder, Dr. Caitlin is a naturopathic doctor in the Denver area caring for women and children and she's also the host of the podcast The Change all dedicated to perimenopause. So Dr. Caitlin it's so great to have you back and I'm excited for our conversation today because sleep is one of those moving targets it feels like in midlife. So let's uh let's just dive in and Um, start with kind of like, first of all, like what are some of the challenges of why sleeping gets harder, say after we turn 40? I think most of us kind of get the idea of, well, yeah, there's more stress in life or maybe we're dealing with burnout, um, which is kind of a given, but what else is going on um, in our bodies, especially with hormones and that sort of thing? Yeah. So sleep is such a huge issue and, and it's tricky because this is a time of life where quality of sleep is even more important, but sometimes it feels, you know, cruel as a suggestion for people. Cause they're like, yeah, I would love to be sleeping more. Like that's why I'm here. Um, so when it comes to sort of the sleep piece during perimenopause, there's a couple different things going on that can be impacting sort of sleep quality. So to review a little bit, During perimenopause, one of the first things that we see happening for most folks is a lowering of progesterone levels. The hormone progesterone is thought to really help modify stress tolerance and and anxiety levels in folks. So for a lot of people, when they notice progesterone lowering over time, which is a common, as our eggs age, the follicles that are produced make less progesterone after ovulation. So the reason why progesterone might be lower in folks during perimenopause is one, just that natural aging process of the egg and the subsequent follicle that is produced post ovulation, which is responsible for our progesterone production. Um, And I guess I should take a couple steps back and just remind folks that in a typical ovulatory cycle, progesterone is primarily produced post ovulation by the leftover follicle that housed the egg. So the egg comes out of retirement. We make a follicle filled with fluid that sort of protects the egg. The egg is released during the process of ovulation. And then between ovulation and the menstrual cycle, the sort of hormone that is dominant during that phase is the hormone of progesterone. So as we get older, progesterone produced by that follicle is naturally a little bit lower. Also, we might see in middle to later perimenopause as people are having cycles that are longer, right? A 40-day cycle, a 50-day cycle, a 60-day cycle. That cycle variability is dictated by the time of ovulation. The post-ovulatory time is always that 10 to 14-day window dictated by progesterone production. So if you have a 28 day cycle, you might ovulate day 14 and produce progesterone for 14 days prior to menses. If you have a 60 day cycle, you are going to only produce progesterone for that last 10 to 14 days of the cycle. And that whole first portion of the cycle, which might be in a 60 day cycle, we'll just do a little math and say you ovulate day 48 or something. Those whole first 48 days, you don't have progesterone during that time period. So we have these lengthening follicular or first components of the cycle that aren't progesterone dominant and these shorter progesterone times in addition to just making less progesterone overall. So lower progesterone can result in less stress tolerance, 
increased anxiety and a decrease in the um, neurotransmitter GABA, which we find calming. So for a lot of folks that can be related to a hard time, like falling asleep and staying asleep, just being a little too anxious and amped up. So that's one component. The second component is variable estrogen levels. So we've talked about before, how during perimenopause and earlier perimenopause, you might have cycles where estrogen is a lot higher, cycles where estrogen is a lot lower. In later to end perimenopause, you might just have consistently lower estrogen. But the area of the brain that regulates circadian rhythm is really dense in estrogen receptors. So that means it is used to a certain level of estrogen, the receptors bind to that estrogen and communicate messages sort of from the hormone system to the circadian rhythm, which dictates like, when do we fall asleep? How long do we stay asleep? During perimenopause, when estrogen levels are so variable, the brain's trying to figure out, well, how many receptors do I need to make here? If estrogen levels are higher, they might respond to that by making less receptors. So they're not overwhelmed. But then next month, estrogen levels are lower and there's not enough receptors to kind of keep up. So it's this interplay between estrogen production and the brain trying to game out how many receptors do we need to sort of gather and interpret this estrogen, um, these estrogen messages that can disrupt circadian rhythms. That's why during perimenopause, we have these cognitive and neurologic symptoms, hot flashes, sleep disruption, mood, that for a lot of folks settle down in a post-menopause state because the brain at that point has figured out, okay, this is the new normal. We're always gonna be lower estrogen. Let's adapt our receptors. Let's kind of change our neural pathways. But during perimenopause, the messages are changing, changing, changing all the time. So the brain can't adapt as quickly, theoretically, right? We're still learning a lot about the sort of brain science in perimenopause, but that's kind of like the best current theory. So one of those areas of the brain that is very estrogen receptor rich is the circadian rhythm. So when our estrogen levels are variable, that circadian rhythm piece can get disrupted and that can impact sleep. Um, then we have hot flashes, right? So hot flashes are also uh, caused by those varying estrogen levels, but hot flashes in and of themselves can cause night sweats, which can disrupt sleep, which is sort of its own category, independent of sort of progesterone, independent of circadian rhythm. We just have straight up hot flashes, which can cause sleep disturbances. Uh, and then as you talked about before, sort of potentially the tendency towards higher stress, as well as something to keep in mind is depression and anxiety also seems to worsen around perimenopause for a lot of folks. And that has its own host of sort of sleep issues that may be directly mediated to what we've talked about, but can sometimes be their kind of own standalone issues. Um, so the bottom line is we can see there are a lot of different potential impacts as to why sleep is going to be challenging for a lot of folks during perimenopause. Absolutely. And then I think to me that it's interesting to think about, you know, the progesterone role as well as the estrogen, because, you know, just in the little bit that I remember hearing about it is, you know, as a younger woman too, like it's all estrogen, 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 like estrogens going haywire. So that's the problem for everything. And so to understand that progesterone piece too, and as that's yeah. tied to that neurotransmitter GABA. I feel like progesterone is a, a unsung hero <laughs> of a hormone, especially when it comes to perimenopause, because in the conventional world, it's really thought that when doing hormone replacement therapy or menopausal hormone therapy, the estrogen's doing the heavy lifting and you just take progesterone for people who have uteruses to protect the uterine lining. Um, so a lot of times like post hysterectomy, uh, people won't even be given progesterone because the thought is, oh, that's just to protect the uterine lining. But our brains are actually do do have sort of progesterone receptors or progesterone receptors in the breast tissue. So I really think progesterone plays an important role here above and beyond just making 
our uteruses sort of more balanced out when they get exposed to estrogen. So, and for some folks, progesterone alone can be a helpful therapeutic. They might not need to do both progesterone and estrogen together. If you have a uterus, you can't do estrogen alone, but anybody can do progesterone by itself. So that's something to consider some as a uh, sort of first step for some folks. But yeah, progesterone is a, is a great, nice calming hormone that I have found can be really helpful for sleep as a standalone. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things in our last episode that we kind of were ending on was some like, just the neurological aspect of perimenopause and yeah. many neurological symptoms that come up that may or not, it might be tied to perimenopause. It might be tied to something else, but a lot of like unexplained neurological related symptoms with that. And I'm thinking too, like when someone is having difficulty sleeping, that they might also get some of those other um, neurological symptoms, particularly like lightheadedness or dizziness. Like if they, they just kind of feel out of it because oh, yeah. it might be related to that sleep issue. I don't know if you've seen that in your practice. Absolutely. Same with like brain fog, issues with cognition, depression and anxiety, fatigue. It's like, in my opinion, like everything rolls downstream from sleep. If people aren't sleeping well, a lot of other symptoms are going to be intensified. Um, So one of the things I always focus on, one of the foundational things in my practice with folks is always talking about how is sleep? Are you having an issue falling asleep? Is it staying asleep? Is it hot flashes? And really drilling down into what exactly are the things impacting sleep and how can we improve that? Because without sleep being good, it's so hard to get improvements in any of the other areas that are concerning for folks when it comes to uh, perimenopause. So it's a, it's definitely a top priority for me when working with people, because if that's not going well, it's so hard for any of the other things to, to get better or go well either. Right. And in our last episode, we were talking kind of about that weight gain piece. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that connection between sleep, maybe sleep cortisol and the weight gain piece. Like how do you see those connect in your practice? Totally connected. Um, It's interesting because again, our our model when it comes to weight is so historically focused on like calories in, calories out, exercise more, increase your intensity. Oftentimes what I'm looking at for people are like sleep, relaxation, stressors. (laughs) Like, no, you want to relax more so your body can modulate their metabolism and get out of that cortisol phase. We know that disrupted sleep um, and not getting enough sleep are uh, can be big triggers for spiking of blood sugar, which can then contribute to insulin resistance. We know for folks who have sleep apnea, that's a huge risk factor for metabolic syndrome, which includes insulin resistance, higher blood pressure, weight gain, all of those things. So it's intimately tied up to all of those pieces, which I which is why I focus on it so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just to recap for folks too, if if you're listening to what Dr. Caitlin is saying, she's not saying it's the food. (laughs) She's not saying it is the exercise or, you know, moving that number on the scale is the most important part. If anything, as she's saying, like, instead of focusing on that number on the scale, we may be focusing on how many hours of sleep are you getting? How many good quality hours of sleep are we getting? And can that be a a more, um, I mean, truly a more holistic approach to, to wellness, especially in this midlife space than just so focused on what that scale is doing? Yeah. Like a lot of times people are like, well, I've been waking up, you know, I'm only getting six hours of sleep because I have to wake up at five 30 to go to my boot camp class. And I'm like, well, how about we just, you know, how about we don't do that? What if you slept in a little bit more, did a more gentle form of exercise in the morning that didn't take up so much time. People often will sacrifice sleep for productivity, for exercise, for so many things. And I'm like, no, it's really the, the most important thing that such a, such a, a big component of overall health that really, that should be the last thing to be sacrificed. We should be prioritizing sleep above almost all else. Um, And this will, one little pitch I want to do right now is for sleep apnea testing. I feel like sleep apnea is 
really underdiagnosed. So sleep apnea, I think a lot of people think, well, if I'm not snoring really loudly or having episodes of like choking or gasping or waking myself up that I must not have sleep apnea. Um, but especially as people are moving to a lower estrogen state of perimenopause, that can cause more um, looseness or laxity in our soft tissue, which can cause some um, issues with airway at night. So not being able to oxygenate well, not being able to breathe through the nose, which produces a different quality of sleep than people who are mouth breathing. So one of the things I always ask people are, are you snoring? Are you a mouth breather? Are you waking up refreshed? Do you have, you know, a dull headache in the morning? Are you grinding your teeth? Sort of all of these things that can indicate that there's some sleep disordered breathing patterns happening. If we're not getting um, quality oxygen oxygenation at night, that's another trigger for cortisol spikes, which can then play into the elevated blood sugar, high blood pressure, that whole piece. Um, so working with a sleep specialist or a airway focused dentist, I think almost everybody would benefit from some form of like sleep apnea testing at some point, but especially if they're dealing with fatigue, not waking, rested, having unexplained weight gain, blood pressure issues, things like that. I think disordered, um, sleep disordered breathing, which is like a spectrum, which includes sleep apnea, but doesn't always have as dramatic presentations, is really overlooked a lot. So that's another thing that I recommend if we're having uh, any sort of suspicions that sleep quality is not where we want it to be, really advocating for testing for sleep apnea and making sure oxygenation is looking good at night. I think that's really important for folks to hear that too, because I think there's a lot of weight stigma around yes. sleep apnea, both maybe for the patients, you know, advocating to their medical professional, like, Hey, maybe I had to get this test yeah. and then thinking like, Oh no, only fat people get yes. sleep apnea yeah. and on the provider side of things, like coming in and seeing this person and say a normal or average size body and saying like, Oh, well, it couldn't be like they're in that size body. They couldn't possibly have sleep apnea. Yeah. So I think that's another one of those conditions that we really need to pull apart from yes. the weight piece. Yeah. It's a way that weight bias negatively impacts people of all sizes because um, those biases, you know, don't benefit anybody because it's a sort of incorrect belief about who should get screened for what, who should get tested for what. So yeah, it's, it's definitely one where I'm always reviewing like sleep quality and like risk factors for sleep apnea and sleep disordered breathing. Mm -hmm. So if you, somebody identifies like yep, I'm in this part of perimenopause or yes, I'm having these symptoms of, of sleep and I'm having a hard time. Like where, do, where do you start in helping them improve their sleep quality? Yeah. So there's, a, there's some basics and this is another thing where you don't have to do everything all at once, right? Cause it can be sort of overwhelming to say, okay, well now I have to produce this like perfect sleep environment. And if I don't do it perfectly, I'm not going to sleep. <laughs> and then that creates its sort of own stressor. But some of the things that we sort of consider a big consideration, I think of is like, what is our room environment? So I'm a really advocate for people having, you know, a bedroom that is primarily reserved for sleep and intimacy sort of only, especially with like people working from home a lot. A lot of folks are like working from their bed, um, which I want people to work in like a cozy environment, but we want our brain to think, oh, I am in my bed. It's bedtime. Not, oh, I do work here. I watch TV here. I, you know, all of these things. So really making a bedroom, trying to separate our bed from the rest of our sort of daily activities. Um, having a room that's cool, ideal sleeping conditions around 68 degrees, which is a lot chillier than a lot of folks keep their homes. Um, so experimenting with decreasing the temperature a little bit and keeping things really dark. And by total darkness, I mean, can't see your hand in front of your face darkness. So for some people that's getting blackout shades, that's getting duct tape or electrical tape to cover up any, you know, 
lights and monitors and sensors in their room. An eye mask, I think eye masks can be really helpful for folks who aren't able to get that level of darkness. Uh, and then some of the basic stuff that many folks are familiar with, keeping screen time and blue light exposure to a minimum. Um, working to increase activity, but keeping your activity levels, your more strenuous activity, like um, stuff that's gonna raise your heart rate, that's gonna be more vigorous to sort of before noon, ideally noon or 2 p.m. And then if we're exercising later in the day, walking or restorative yoga, things like that, but not more activity overall, but not doing strenuous activity at night before bed. Um, the food piece is interesting. For some people, they'll be, be do better having a two to three hour before bed of not eating. Uh, for some folks during perimenopause, reflux, heartburn, things like that can contribute to sleep in ways they hadn't before. So having that break before bed can be helpful. For other folks, having a snack before bed <laughs> can be helpful, especially um, a snack with a little bit of like protein and complex carbohydrate. That's a, that's an individual thing. That's why our, there's not like a one size fits all. The other dietary thing I've noted is as people are experiencing more with things like keto and paleo and things like that, low carb diets can definitely disrupt sleep, especially for women that I have observed. So making sure people are getting enough carbohydrates throughout the day, but especially getting some carbohydrate foods with their evening meal, I found that has been really helpful for sustaining sleep because especially for folks who wake up in the middle of the night, one trigger for nighttime waking can be low blood sugar or blood sugar crashing, which then triggers a cortisol response. Then people wake up like, oh, I'm ready. I'm ready to be awake. The day has started, but it's like 2 a.m. Um, so the blood sugar balance piece I found can be really helpful as well. And I think for a lot of people that, you know, we hear about the screen time side of things, um, but hearing that the food piece, both like might need a snack, might not need a snack, depending on who someone is. But just from what you're saying is that check in with yourself, you might yeah. be on either side of that spectrum, but checking in for yourself versus I'm um, following this intermittent fasting plan. And they're saying like, don't eat after 8 p.m. or yeah. don't eat after, you know, five, six, whatever. Yeah. I mean, especially when I hear some of these folks that their, their window of eating, even if it's eight hours, but they're still stopping eating at like five or 6 p.m. And then they want to get up the next morning and do a workout or something like there might, they might not be eating enough. And so to, yeah. to understand that piece of if you're waking up in the middle of the night, like you're raring to go ready for the day, could that also be related to like, you just didn't get enough carbohydrate in the middle yeah. of the night and your body no, saying like, Hey, I need some fuel. Not yeah. enough carbohydrate, not enough fuel. I know. I see, I see that piece a lot. And then the other food piece is alcohol. I mean, I don't, I guess alcohol isn't technically, <laughs> it's, a food, it's not a food necessarily, but it kind of falls into that same habit where alcohol tends to be pretty disruptive for most people's sleep, but we see that increase during perimenopause. Um, I think for a number of reasons, blood sugar being more sensitive, the sort of neurologic symptom, system overall being more sensitive. Um, but one of the, biggest things I have people experiment when they're having issues with sleep quality, again, especially waking up in the middle of the night is cutting out alcohol for two to three weeks in a row and sort of, um, charting their sleep quality, because I think for a lot of folks, they're not registering, Oh, that one to two glasses of wine per night with dinner. We, we consider that like a moderate alcohol intake, but if you look at the research, Heavy drinking in women is described as seven drinks per week, um, where moderate is zero to four. Um, so people who are having a glass of wine per week on the research side of things, they're falling into that category of like heavy alcohol intake, um, which has a number of potential considerations, but definitely for sleep, it can impact people. Even if they're not feeling tipsy or drunk, it might be changing their neurochemistry, their blood sugar in a way where especially that middle of the night waking can be exacerbated. So that's another experiment that I have people do. Other people makes no difference. Same with caffeine. Some folks can, you know, drink an espresso and fall right 
to bed because of how their body metabolizes caffeine. Other people might realize, oh, during this phase of my life, I need to cut back on caffeine. Um, even for slow metabolizers, caffeine might not get out of the bloodstream for 10 to 12 hours, which means you know anything after 9 or 10 a.m. might be impacting sleep. So there's so many little self sort of reflection experiments that we have folks go to because it's not sort of cookie cutter one size fits all but there are things that might be impacting one person greater than another um, and figuring out okay for me and for this phase of life not forever not how things were 10 years ago but for me right now how are these habits you know serving or not serving me and let's run a little experiment take some notes see what happens I'm so glad you brought up the caffeine piece because as you were talking about alcohol, I was jotting down notes like, oh, we got to talk about caffeine then too, because it seems like there's the, you know, the have and then the not have, like there's two very distinct groups yes. when it comes to midlife too. Like you got to be giving up this or trading up for your green tea or whatever. Yeah. And so I'm glad you brought that up. It's variable. I'm je I am jealous of the people that can drink all the caffeine that they want because I don't fall into that. Corey and I wish that I did because I really love getting high on coffee and like running around and doing things. But I've noticed, especially at this phase of my life, I was never a great metabolizer of caffeine, metabolizer of caffeine, but it's even less so now. And I really had to be like, all right, <laughs> this is a thing. <laughs> Fill out a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's not that it's good or bad, right? It's like breaking out of the mold of judging habits of good or bad, or nobody should do this, or everybody should do this, but more like, how is this working for me? And how motivated am I by the outcome to make the change, right? Some people might be like, yeah, I drink caffeine. I know it affects my sleep, but I want to do it anyway. That's valid. Everybody gets to make their own choice, but that awareness of the connection is the important piece. And I talk to that with my patients all the time. I'm like, just because we make this connection doesn't mean you never can do it again but it means you're entering into that choice from a conscious decision of, oh, I know the outcome and I'm fine with it. I you know, would <laughs> rather wake up in the middle of the night a little hot and sweaty because I chose to drink wine tonight than never drink it again. And I'm fine with that choice, which is also reasonable, but it lets you kind of do your own equation as to, is this a worthwhile endeavor? Yes or no. Yeah. Connecting dots is so, so, so important. I think in this, in this midlife space for anything, exercise, yeah. food, all the things. Um, and so, you know, if someone comes in, they've been working on some of these say lifestyle behavior changes, trying to work on the sleep piece. And they're like, ah, I'm still dogging it. I still can't yeah. I'm having a hard time. So what are some of your therapeutic interventions that you might pull out? Yeah. And the part of, partially it's figuring out, okay, is it falling asleep? Is it staying asleep? Or is it like hot flashes, night sweats? Because those are gonna have potentially different therapeutics applied. And I think that's another place where people run into trouble as they say, oh, well, I took this herb, it's supposedly good for sleep, but it's like, well, what component of the sleep cycle is it potentially helpful for? So if people are having a problem falling asleep, one of my favorite interventions is melatonin. Melatonin is a great research-based intervention for sleep onset latency, which is a type of insomnia, which is basically like, it's hard to fall asleep. Um, the contraindications for melatonin is it makes some people have bad dreams, like they dream very intensely on it. And it makes some people groggy in the morning. That is usually because they're taking too high of a dose. Um, I really think anywhere between a half to one milligram of melatonin taken as a sublingual, so taken under the tongue, so it absorbs quickly, you know, 30-ish minutes before you want to be falling asleep is a really easy, low-key intervention that's inexpensive, easy to access. It works for a lot of people. And I don't have as many concerns as maybe is found um, sort of in the conventional wisdom of, oh, you know, there's no evidence that taking melatonin decreases your body's ability to produce melatonin. Of all the supplements that we use, it probably has some of the most robust safety data. So when people are having a fall, hard time falling asleep, I think melatonin is like a very reasonable place to start. 
Um, another reasonable place to start for folks, especially let's say if the issue isn't falling asleep, but it's like hot flash related, hot flashes, night sweats, menopausal hormone therapy, hormone replace therapy is, you know, our quickest way, in my opinion, of getting like from point A to point B, as far as stopping hot flashes. Um, for a lot of people, once hot flashes and night sweats are resolved, they're getting better quality of sleep, which then helps mood, which then helps cognition. So that I think is an intervention for sleep that is often overlooked. And if I'm looking at risk benefit ratios of potentially, you know, menopausal hormone therapy compared to a lot of the commonly prescribed sleep aids, Ambien, benzodiazepines, even antihistamines, which are commonly used now to help people sleep like Benadryl PM or um, some of those other medications. There's a little bit of concern with long-term use of some of those medications as far as like brain health and dementia risk and things like that. So if I'm like weighing pros and cons, my personal opinion is that menopausal hormone therapy is going to be a net safer intervention than some of the common sort of prescription medications that are used for sleep. Um, then we can get into like our whole sort of rich realm of botanical medicine, which I think can be very helpful for sleep. Um, passion flower, so the herb passion flower is one of my favorite botanicals for people who have like a busy mind. So a hard time falling asleep because they're sort of ruminating, they're anxious, um, or they wake up in the middle of the night anxious, you can sort of redose it at that point. So I really love passion flower for that. Um, another herb that is probably the most famous falling asleep herb is the herb valerian root. Uh, valerian root has a very long sort of traditional use for sleep. The one caveat with valerian is for some people, it can have a paradoxical effect. So I'd say 90% of people sleep better on valerian. 10% of people are going to get ramped up on valerian and be able to sort of sleep less. So that's just something to be aware of. It doesn't work universally for everyone. Um, for people who are waking up, up in the night, there's a sort of different category of herbs. So for people who are having a hard time falling asleep, usually we're looking at botanicals or interventions that are more like calming, relaxing, herbs for anxiety, kind of mildly sedating herbs, etc. When people are waking up in the middle of the night, and it's not necessarily because of hot flashes, they're not sweaty, um, and the most common time we see this is around like 2, 2 a.m., 1 to 2 a.m., people wake up and they can't fall back asleep. Um, that is often a sort of stress adrenal picture where ideally at night, melatonin is predominant and cortisol levels are low and cortisol levels stay low till around like six, seven in the morning, depending on the time of year. Ideally, the sun goes up, your cortisol level goes up, it wakes you up. Oftentimes those middle of the night wakings that are just accompanied by that feeling of like, I am now awake. <laughs> it should be daytime, but it's two in the morning and I can't go back to sleep. That is often more associated with like a cortisol dysregulation. Again, long-term stressors, blood sugar issues can play a role. But when it comes to picking botanicals that help with staying asleep, um, magnolia bark, which is a Chinese herb originally, magnolia bark seems to work really well at buffering those middle of the night sort of cortisol spikes. So that's where I'm talking about, you know, sometimes when people will say, oh, I have insomnia, I took melatonin, it didn't help. And I'm like, well, what's your problem? I have no problem falling asleep, but I wake up at two in the morning. And it's like, oh, okay. Melatonin is not gonna help you with that potentially. Um, if people have a problem staying as falling asleep, but once they fall asleep, they can stay asleep all night. Okay. We look at sort of some different things. So it's understanding that pattern piece. The other botanical, um, that can be helpful for some people, especially with staying asleep is, um, CBD. So not necessarily cannabis derived CBD, which has THC in it, which for some people makes them sleepy for some people makes them a little anxious. So that's one that can be sort of hard to modulate, but hemp derived CBD or cannabis derived CBD can be really helpful at staying asleep, but the dose is really critical. Most people aren't going to respond. The, the, the 
common dose is between 25 to 50 milligrams of CBD. And a lot of these like nighttime gummies, they've got like five milligrams or 10 milligrams. It can be expensive to get up to a therapeutic dose with CBD, which is often what I tell people. It's, you know, a pretty popular botanical right now. People want to try CBD. Um, and I think it can be helpful, but usually I say, Hey, let's start with some of our more like more in excess, our more inexpensive, easily accessible herbs and potentially save CBD for later, mostly because the cost to get up to an effective dose is, is, is higher than it's going to be for some of these other botanicals. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned at the kind of start of the call, we, you mentioned GABA and uh, the other one that I've, I'm familiar with is 5-HTP, 5-hydroxy tryptophan. Yeah. So from like the supplement side of things, what are your thoughts on like, this? Someone is supplementing with GABA or supplementing with 5-HTP. Yeah. So GABA can be helpful in sort of promoting that anti-anxiety calming bedtime. The other botanic, the other neurotransmitter supplement that sort of pairs really well with that is L-theanine. So the nutrient L-theanine, often you'll see in sleep formulas when there's sort of an anxiety component there. And those are both very nice and very gentle. 5-HTP helps in the production of serotonin, which at some point for some people, there's a sort of pathway that goes like 5-HTP, tryptophan, serotonin, melatonin, as far as the production of brain chemicals. So taking 5-HTP at night for some folks will stimulate sort of melatonin production. I think of 5-HTP as being more helpful when there's like a mood component to their sleep that, you know, sleeplessness is associated specifically with depression for them. Because we think about the supplement 5-HTP or the botanical St. John's wort is two ways to support serotonin production. And that can be very helpful. There's actually a small study done on St. John's wort and women in perimenopause showing that it helped with insomnia and mood. So that's definitely one I'll pull out um, when depression is sort of more playing a role. The biggest caveat with both 5-HTP and St. John's wort is they're not to be used in combination with any SSRI medication. So like Lexapro, Zoloft, because those are working on the serotonin pathways already. So we don't want to overwhelm folks with too much serotonin because there is too much of a good thing and there can be some significant complications with serotonin syndrome. So those are my biggest caveats anytime we're directly stimulating that serotonin pathway is that something we want to make sure that there's no medication interactions for. That's a good point. Yeah. So if this kind of, you know, as we're wrapping up our sleep discussion, and I love that we're ending with like the therapeutic benefits and particularly exploring those botanicals. And so if folks are interested to learn more about that botanical piece, I want to invite listeners to listen to our part two with Dr. Caitlin, as we're going to dive even a little bit more into those botanicals, like what does research say? What is history say? What does, uh, uh, what can other botanicals can be helpful, not just for sleep, but also maybe for regular perimenopause experiences. So definitely um, stay tuned for our part two of this conversation, where we're going to dive into those uh, botanicals a little bit more. <laughs> part two, part two. <laughs> All right, welcome back. For those of you that listened to part one of my conversation with Dr. Caitlin, we were talking all about sleep and we kind of ended the conversation on sleep and therapeutic uh, remedies for that, both from a supplement standpoint, as well as a botanical standpoint. And today we're gonna dive a little bit more into that botanical side of things too. So um, Dr. Caitlin, where would you like us to like start with our ground, ground floor knowledge yes. of like what's cool with botanicals? What are we watching out for? In part of our last conversation, you were talking about like um, with serotonin and medications and how there we need to watch out for maybe some overlap between botanicals and medications. So how do we like know where to even start with botanical right. medicine? Yeah. And I I think a good place to start is like with the definition, because what I've noticed is out there, you know, in the world, there's 
a lot of over terms that are used interchangeably that don't necessarily move, mean the same thing. So people might say, oh, I'm using holistic medicine or I'm using homeopathic medicine or I'm using natural medicine or I'm using naturopathic medicine. And they can be talking about very different modalities and very different things. So botanical medicine is a modality specifically of using plants and using plants, that, how it differentiates from homeopathy is using, homeopathy can use any sort of materials but in like minuscule, non-biochemically active forms. So when we're talking about bio botanical medicine, we're talking about using whole, like but biochemically active doses of plants. And specifically, you know, that, that gets a little tricky because you're like, well, what about, you know, when I'm eating pesto, basil is an herb and I'm eating it. And I'm like, yes, that is a component of botanical or herbal medicine. You can access plants as foods, that's one way to use herbal medicine. That's one way that I think is a very like safe and accessible way. You can use turmeric as a spice that is using botanical medicine. Um, but typically what we're talking about when people are using botanical or herbal medicine is using specific herbs applied therapeutically, which is they're, they're using them either for like acute or chronic conditions, hoping to achieve a specific outcome. Um, and the other important thing to remember is there's many different traditions of botanical or herbal medicine. So for example, my training as a naturopathic doctor, we were primarily learning sort of Western herbalism, which has roots in sort of Europe, early American history, obviously influenced by many other traditions, but that's gonna use herbs in a way that's sort of very different, for example, than like traditional Chinese medicine. Um, it's interesting, I have a lot of colleagues who are acupuncturists and we'll talk about the same herb, for example, like the herb licorice and in, in, in naturopathic medicine, we you know use it for these things. In Chinese medicine, it's applied completely differently to like totally different conditions. So it's important to, not necessarily that the, uh, you know, the person who's starting to use botanical medicine for themselves, you know, knows the difference between all of the traditions, but understands that botanicals are going to be used differently by different practitioners. Um, and that different traditions might use the same herb in different ways, or there might be herbs, people will bring me their botanicals that their um, Chinese medicine provider has given them. And I'm like, they're like, what do you think about these? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like I wasn't trained in that medicine. I love Chinese medicine. I'm like, I trust these formulas. They've been used for thousands of years, but not everybody's going to be trained in every form of botanical medicine. And the way the herbs are prescribed, the types of formulas that are used are going to be variable from tradition to tradition. Um, for example, in Chinese medicine, they almost always pre uh, prescribe formulas that have multiple herbs in them. Some Chinese formulas have like 20 to 30 botanicals in one formula. In Western medicine, Western botanical medicine, a lot of times we might prescribe single herbs or herbs that are, um, have maybe like three to five ingredients. So that's sort of one big difference. Are we using one herb at once? Some traditions very much promote, you know, simples, which is just the use of one herb. Are you using a formula? And then is that formula like customized to you? Or is it a formula that has, you know, been passed down and is kind of always the same thing? So we talk about herbal medicine as this sort of broad umbrella, but within it, there's so many different ways to apply it, which is great because it gives us so many options, but it also means there's a lot of thought to go into. Like sometimes people say, well, I tried herbal medicine. I tried botanicals. They didn't work. And I'm like, really? You tried every single herb in the, you know, all of these herbs are different. So it might be, oh, I worked, you know, I went to the store and I picked out one botanical. It didn't work for me. Maybe I should consult with a Chinese medicine provider. Maybe Ayurvedic botanical medicine might be sort of a better fit for me. So there's so many different traditions under botanical medicine that it offers almost like unlimitless potential as far as what you can do and how you can sort of apply it to yourself. But it also means that sometimes working with a provider that has training 
in a specific modality so they can say yes okay if you you know google herbs good for perimenopause and you get this list of 50 herbs how do you know what's going to work for you oftentimes you know for example i'll talk about the herb black cohosh black cohosh is often used for folks with perimenopause and early menopausal symptoms um it can be helpful for hot flashes but very specifically black cohosh has a particular symptom picture it tends to be somebody who's having symptoms of depression alongside of their perimenopause um in Western medicine, it was described as somebody who feels like they've had a black cloud descend on top of them. That's a very sort of specific indication for black cohosh. There's often a component of like neck pain and musculoskeletal pain for somebody who benefits from black cohosh. And then there's hot flashes and insomnia as well. Compare that to say St. John's wort, which is an herb that has also been studied to help with insomnia and hot flashes but might have a different picture. The people with St. John's work might have depression, but not the musculoskeletal symptoms. They might be um, sad, but not necessarily like fatigued. So once you get to know the botanicals a little bit more, it helps you figure out who do I think is gonna respond sort of best to this intervention versus oh i just went and picked this off the shelf and it says it's you know for sleep so and i think that explains why for some folks they have a hard time finding botanical medicine that works for them it might not be the right picture but also why when we try to study botanical medicine in the western research model so a lot of times the gold standard for you know, medicines in contemporary, you know, Western medicine is the randomized control trial, which is you've got one group of people that gets an intervention and you compare it to another group of people who didn't get the intervention. And the only difference between those two groups is did they get a placebo or did they get the active medicine? But there's not a differentiation. So you might sort of recruit people into your trial for hot flashes and say, okay, 50% of you get black cohosh and 50% of you get a pill full of like uh, an inactive substance, a placebo. And then you judge, hey, how did that botanical medicine work based on how many people in that group that received the medicine like responded to the intervention? But that's not how botanical medicine was practiced historically. You wouldn't say every single person who has this complaint that comes into my office gets this one intervention. You would talk to them and say, oh, how did it start? What are your other symptoms? What's your constitution? Do you tend to be hot? Do you tend to be cold? Do you tend to do the this or that? And then you personalize the intervention based on that picture. It's really hard to add that level of personalization to research so what that often looks like is we see herbs that we know have a great traditional efficacy, not always perform as well as we would expect when they're, they're studied in that randomized control trial, which doesn't mean they necessarily don't work or you shouldn't try them unless there's like a safety or interaction issue. It just means that when we look at this model that is very individualized and based on matching the picture to the person, that that doesn't necessarily translate to the way we practice medicine now, which is much more protocol or algorithm. You know, this symptom is, X symptom is treated by like Y intervention, and it's a little bit more like mechanistic versus individualized. So I think understanding that can help us under people realize why it can sometimes be hard to get the efficacy we would expect in randomized controlled trials, even though a lot of botanicals do show up really well there, sometimes it's not as robust as we would expect or hope. Um, and that can sometimes lead folks to sort of be dismissive and say, oh, well, there's not research or, oh, it doesn't show that that's, you know, effective. I think we want to pay attention to how things perform in that one way of knowing, which is that sort of randomized control trial, but also understand, well, how have these different remedies been applied sort of traditionally and how is the system they're applied in different from the system that's studying them? And could it be a mismatch between the systems 
versus, oh, well, that doesn't work or, you know, there's no evidence to support that. So I think that's an important consideration as well. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought that up because I, even within the naturopathic community, I will see like people that are you know, very evidence-based in their practice, which is great, but they're very stuck to, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but they're very informed by what is that random controlled trial looking yeah. like. And you're right in that not all, not all therapies are going to fit themselves well into that model. I mean, honestly, like nutrition can kind of be a good example of that yeah. too, unless we're like isolating this one component out of blueberries to study. Yeah. And, and unless we're controlling for someone's age and economic status and education and like all these other things, it can be hard to like land on what did that research result say? And then take that as like, this is going to work for everybody. So, yeah. you know, I, I bring that example up to kind of, cause I think people will identify with that because they've probably read something on some food thing, you know, on Google or in some magazine somewhere and they've gone and try it and they're like, ah, it don't, doesn't really land with me. Yeah. And so to have that as the same parallel with botanical medicine too. And for when they hear like, oh, well, that's not well-researched or that doesn't have enough evidence base behind it to understand, well, why is that? Yes. And I love your explanation of that botanical medicine is so individualized in terms yes. of when, it, when and how it's applied that would just be really hard to study. And there's yeah. probably not a lot of funding for that. Well, yeah, we're not even getting into the whole yeah. idea of, you know, it takes so much money to do a well-funded, I mean, I think you see that in nutrition as well. It's hard to get the funding and the sort of institutional support to do, you know, trials that have tens of thousands of people. So a lot of times, you know, botanical studies might have like 30 people or a hundred people. And then folks will be like, well, yeah, that's good, but we need to repeat it. And it's like, well, no, you know, there's not, unfortunately, the vast majority of research is funded by the pharmaceutical industry and there's not a huge well of resources to look at botanicals or nutritional interventions or sort of interventions that are less likely to result in like a patent that makes money. It's just not, you know, not how the system is set up. So yeah, even if you did have the unlimited funds to create these studies, it's hard because humans are not machines. There are social factors, there's economic factors, there's genetic factors. We're so complex that it can be difficult to narrow that down, which is why you need studies with, you know, thousands to tens of thousands to hundred thousands of people to start to like see those big trends but actually getting that data is so hard. So I think understanding, oh, there's some stuff that is so interesting and so helpful to glean from that research. But I think of it as you know one way of knowing, right? But there are also other ways of knowing. There's clinical experience, there's personal experience, there's intuitive experience, how people's experiences in their own body, there's you know traditions like, again, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine that have thousands of years of passed down tradition, that is another way of knowing that I think we also should, you know, honor and respect in an equal way. Our culture is very much puts our sort of Western way of knowing as a pedestal. It's like, this is the way. And it's like, this is a way. It's important. It's interesting. We can learn from it, but it's not the only way. And it's not, you know, the only way of knowing. So I like to put it in context, certainly use it, um, reference it, but not have it be the end all and be all as far as what I'm willing to suggest and work with for patients and you know, uh, how I evaluate my interest in using a particular therapeutic or not. I think the other piece too with botanicals that, and I have just a very small knowledge of it, more from the culinary herb side of things, yeah. but is, uh, and we were, you know, it'd be great to dive into this, is there's the different pieces of the plant and there are different efficacies or one part of the yeah. plant might be used for this or one part of the plant might be used for that. And so for if people are going out to like 
look at their natural food store at supplements or at or botanicals and they're curious or they're even having a conversation with their provider too like tell us a little bit more about that difference between like the forms the type are we rooting are we leafing like what are we doing other that's the other part that really gets me at research sometimes is you can tell that they didn't consult with a botanist or an herbalist and they're using the wrong part of a plant or the wrong species of a plant or the wrong dose. And you're like, yeah, of course that wouldn't work. That would be like saying, oh, I took, we did a study and we gave somebody one twelfth of an aspirin and it didn't help their headache. Aspirin doesn't work. And you're like, well, yeah, dose matters, form matters. Um, And I think when it comes to botanicals, that's one of the reasons why I'm very particular about brands and sources when it comes to botanical medicine. Um, when it comes to some, some things like, where do you get your magnesium from? You know, as long as it's the source we're looking for, I don't really care. Where are you getting your, you know, B12 from? You know, as long as it's the form that I want, you can get it from any, you know, you can get it from Amazon, you can get it from the grocery store, you can get it wherever. When it comes to botanicals, I really refer people to, specific brands for example i like the brand gaia herbs um if they're sourcing like whole herbs and teas for themselves i like mountain rose herbs or frontier because a lot of companies are not if they're not run by botanists and herbalists they're just going to be sourcing random herbs from who knows where and putting them into capsules Whereas some botanicals you want to be water extracted to get their effectiveness. Others should be in alcohol. Others, for example, like medicinal mushrooms and people are taking medicinal mushrooms. The majority of medicinal mushrooms are gonna do better in like a specific hot water extract and then encapsulated versus like a raw powder. So when it comes to botanicals, using the right species matters, using the right form matters, using the right extraction matters. And we don't expect like, I mean, it's complicated for me and I've been you know, studying this for 15 years. I don't expect the person walking in the street saying like, oh, you know, I think I'd like to try you know, botanical medicine for this symptom to be able to have that knowledge to differentiate, which is why we wanna rely on using a brand that is trustworthy, Herb Farm, which is spelled with a P, I think, Herb, H-E-R-B, PHA arm, like pharmacy. Herb Farm is another one that's like commonly um, found at like a grocery store or a health food store, but it's run by botanists. They've been in practice for a long time. So what I have, what I recommend for folks who are interested in engaging in botanical medicine, maybe their interest level hasn't gotten to the point where they want to work directly sort of within herbalist, although a lot of communities will have like a botanical like apothecary or medicinal store that has like bulk herbs and things like that in their sort of town or neighborhood, in which case, you know, walking in and just chatting with the people who work there can be helpful. Um, But working with a brand that is run by, you know, botanists and herbalists can be helpful because then you can assume, okay, they're using a proper dosage, they're using a form that's appropriate, and they're testing their botanicals for contaminants, they're either growing them locally, or, you know, sourcing them um, internationally from folks who are looking for uh, looking for contaminants, because that is a very real concern for remedies that are imported from other countries is there has been cases of like lead poisoning and other types of uh, contaminants coming in from those botanicals. So working with a botanical company that's screening for some of those things is really important. It's one of those things where I'm like, you know, don't buy the random product on Amazon. You know, I love, well, I'm not gonna say I love, I have a complex relationship with Amazon and, you know, Amazon Prime delivery. This is an area where I'm like, yeah, you don't want to just buy the random product off the internet or even off of Instagram, you know, some of the, or, you know, some of the other social media where they're target marketing you necessarily, um, really kind of taking an extra step to look at the quality piece, to look at what testing the company's doing, who are they working with? Because botanical medicine that's gonna make a huge difference. If it's effective, if it's safe, it's gonna be, how is it produced? Where is it produced? 
what are the dosages in there? Um, so working with one of those quality companies, I think makes a big difference. And then if you're on, you know, when it comes to the safety piece, botanical medicine, I think is inherently mostly, especially what people are going to be able to access on their own, um, going to be a really safe intervention. What we want to make sure is if people are on any prescription or over the counter medications that they've chatted with their pharmacist. Um, I think pharmacists are the best folks to chat to about drug herb interactions. If you don't have a practitioner who is, um, comfortable with that. I feel like a lot of folks, if they're not comfortable or just like, I don't know, you shouldn't take it. Maybe there's an interaction versus I found a lot of pharmacists will actually look into the data and let you know either, Hey, there's no information, which is often the case, but there doesn't seem to be any risk based on, you know, how we know this drug works and how this botanical works. So we want to make sure one, there's no interactions and two, we're applying the right intervention at the right time. I think one of the concerns people have with botanical medicines, especially folks who are more conventionally trained, is that people are going to forego a safe conventional treatment that could be very beneficial for potentially an alternative treatment that is going to end up being dangerous because they didn't do the initial treatment, right? So for example, if somebody um, has a significant diagnosis, say like a cancer diagnosis, and it's like, oh, there is, it's, you know, one of the cancers that maybe has a clear therapeutic path with chemotherapy and a fairly good, you know, success rate in treatment, and people are foregoing that path for potentially an unproven botanical path. Certainly everybody gets to like be the boss of their own healthcare. However, I think we wanna make sure that we are applying the right tool at the right time and understanding what are the limitations potentially and not abandoning or foregoing a treatment that might be sort of life-saving or, or really helpful. Um, that's, I think, the, the, my biggest safety consideration. There's, it's rare that we're going to come across an herb that's going to be directly harmful outside of potentially a drug-herb interaction. But I do think sometimes if we're delaying other treatments, uh, that is where we could potentially see some harm. Are you ha is there anybody in your background that's snoring? I, my dog just came. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's okay. I was just a little weird out. Like, is somebody hacking oh, Zoom? Like, <laughs> yeah. My dog just climbed up on my lap. And I was no, like, no, no. That's totally okay as long as I know what it is. Because there's been like hacking with Zoom. And right. Stuff You're like, like so okay, hold on. I'm gonna make her go <laughs> sit over here. She's so big and fat. Ladybug, get over here. <laughs> Oh, hi, friend. Oh, yeah, it sounded like a that type of puppy. <laughs> How she will, she will not move out of the couch. It's okay. When, now we, we know what it is. It's totally cool. <laughs> I know you're like, wow, she like crept up as I was talking. I was like, get out of here. But I couldn't like get her to move without like causing a ruckus. All right, go. Go lay down. You cannot sit and snore anymore, Goofy. All right. <laughs> That's so perfect. I thought, is somebody like knowing that we're doing a conversation on sleep and so they hacked in and they're snoring? And snoring on us. Oh, it's just a giant bulldog who thinks she's a lap dog. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Well, now I know that what that, that is. And the other thing then that I wanted to ask you too, and we've already kind of talked about like some of the botanicals that think can be good for midlife, but if there's yeah. anything else that you want to add for like midlife, not just sleep stuff, but like we talked about in the, in the in part two or part one, but any other botanicals that you find helpful for folks in this stage of life? Yeah, I think um, one area of botanicals that can be really helpful is the category of herbs called adaptogens. Mm -hmm. So adaptogenic herbs are sort of herbs that are generally thought to help the body adapt during times of increased stress. And I emphasize this a lot during perimenopause, the body is dealing with the physiologic stressor of changing hormone levels. So dealing with like sort of the additional external stressors can be harder. So I find adaptogenic herbs 
to be really helpful sort of during this phase. Um, some examples of those, I really like the herb maca. Maca can be really helpful, especially for energy, libido, um, mood. I kind of think about maca for that specifically. Uh, the herb ashwagandha, which is a traditional Ayurvedic herb, that can be great. I think of ashwagandha as being like a gentle nerve tonic. So it's not going to um, kind of for the wired and tired people where we don't actually want you to be more energized. We want you to be sort of more calm and centered and have your nervous system like have a little bit more buffered. I love ashwagandha for that. Um, other things that I think about, holy basil, that's another Ayurvedic herb. There's a lot of great Ayurvedic adaptogenic formulas. And what I think about as an adaptogen are these are herbs that we think of as like tonics, which is like, oh, you can take them every day for long periods of time. You might not notice a difference on day one. Oftentimes you have to take adaptogenic herbs for eight to 12 weeks. And it's more of like an ongoing tonifying effect. There's some herbs that you use more acutely, like we talked about passion flower for sleep. That is an herb where you take it once and you should notice that. Kava, not a chronic herb, you don't wanna take it every day because it can be hard on the liver, but kava as an acute herb, you can take it immediately and feel calm immediately. So that's another thing to differentiate when we're using botanical medicine. Is this an acute remedy? Or is it an ongoing remedy? And how long do I have to take it before I determine, is it working yes or no? Because um, I think we tend, what I've noticed is people tend to be pretty impatient when it comes to their botanical medicines. And we tend to expect them to work at a level that we wouldn't necessarily expect. You know, let's say we got a SSRI for depression. Um, most people know, oh, we have to give it six to eight weeks before we evaluate if it's working yes or like or not. Um, I think a lot of people say, well, I took, I took that for like three or four days. I didn't notice any difference. So I stopped taking it. And I'm like, well, let's be fair to our botanical friends. Um, so understanding, you know, what is the symptom I'm looking to address? What are the details of my particular symptom that might differentiate it from, you know, using this herb versus another one? Um, and then how long should I take it? Is this a botanical that has like an acute effect? or is it more ongoing? And then like, for example, when it comes to adaptogens, we might say, oh, let's take this herb for three to six months and then let's switch to something else. We don't necessarily use the same thing in and out sort of forever. Um, cordyceps, which is actually a mushroom, not technically an herb, but still a botanical medicine. Uh, cordyceps can be a really great adaptogenic herb. I love all of the sort of mushrooms. Um, Lion's mane is great for the sort of mental and cognitive components of perimenopause, as is an herb called uh, bacopa. That can be really helpful for memory and concentration. It's so hard because I think the, you know, list of what herbs we could be do for this is so long. Once I start talking about it, I'm like, well, or we could do this or, or we could do that. That's where either like working with a practitioner or getting, you know, some books like going to the library or going to your local herb store um, and looking at like, oh, what are, you know, reading a quick book on like botanicals for perimenopause. Um, a couple great herbalists that have books, uh, Dr. Aviva Ram, she started out as an herbalist and midwife. Uh, then ended up, she went to Yale, she went to, she went to, you know, fancy Ivy League schools, now a MD family practice doc, but she has some great books on using botanical medicine. Um, Amanda McQuaid Crawford, she's a, I think an Australian herbalist. I really like her work. Um, Susan Weed is another sort of famous herbalist that has some great books around menopause or perimenopause. A lot of people aren't going to have access to a practitioner that's you know, well-versed in botanical medicine, but because of the safety profile of most botanicals, it is an area where I'm like, hey, if it's safe to do so, as far as like the parameters of the symptoms we're trying to treat, let's say something like insomnia or hot flashes, where there's some leeway into how we want to address it and our time frame for addressing it, then why not do some self-experimentation? Why not, you know, 
read a couple articles, read a couple books, do a little bit of education and say, all right, I'm going to experiment with this plant at this dose for this long. I think that's the important part is to say, am I taking the right form? Am I taking the right dose? How long do I take it for? And what are my expectations? And then just doing, doing some self-experimentation and seeing what happens. That's what I think the beauty of the botanical medicine is, is it invites some like self-reflection and some experimentation and some like checking in with yourself and a little bit of self-care because maybe you're going to this, you know, the botanical store to pick out this particular tea. You're making it for yourself. You're taking the time to, you know, mix up a formula or things like that. That's where it gets like very fun and also has that impact of like nurturing yourself and investing in your own wellness, which is some of the things that I really love about botanical medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going and getting some of those books. I know that the other name that comes to my mind is Rosemary Gladstar. Oh yes. Yes. I love Rosemary Gladstar. Yeah. Yeah. And she has, I have at least one of her books and there's another one that uh, I'm forgetting the person's name, but they're an herbalist and they trained with Rosemary and yeah. both of them have like some recipes in the back. So whether it's, it is more of like that food-based side of things, or it's making a tea or how do you make a tincture or so d- helping people understand that the, the, what of the herb that you use and then the, how yeah. you use it too. Like some of those books can be really great for some of the recipes. And I think it's a great mind shift switch for some folks, because we're so used to approaching medicine as I go somewhere, I tell somebody else what's going on. They prescribe something for me, which is usually in the prescription world, like a pill that I take once a day or twice a day. And it's slightly passive, not to say that it's not super helpful or indicated, but it's kind of top down medicine. Um, And it's not, I mean, you can't like go to the pharmacy and be like, hey, I think I'm gonna try that. I wonder what dose I should take. Maybe I'll take a little bit more, right? There's safety differences because pharmaceuticals are dialed down to like one particular molecule a lot of the times. And it's very concentrated and it has a direct linear active, you know, constituent that does one thing, right? There's not a lot of room to play around. There's not a lot of room. And there's maybe some more concerns about, you know, safety if you take too much and things like that. In the world of botanicals, it's different because you're taking a whole plant that's going to have like multiple constituents at lower doses that haven't been altered to, you know, grab the cellular receptors, which is much intensity. You have the ability to play around with dose. And it's also a more like bi-directional community-based medicine, right? Where you're thinking, well, how does this make me feel? And oh, am I resonating more with this description of the herb versus this herb? And it really invites the person as a more active participant in their healthcare, I think, in a way which can be very different and very rewarding than perhaps the ways that we're like used to interfacing with like medicine and care. So that's another cool component that I love about that botanical medicine. It's just like a different system and some different tools that have a little bit more leeway, a little bit more room for experimentation and play and intuition um, than we're used to. And it really puts sort of the individual into a seat of power of being like, all right, yeah, what, let me try this. Is it working for me? How do I know? So that's one of the reasons why I think it's such a great tool to put into that perimenopausal toolkit, which is fairly limited when it comes to interventions, right? There's, you know, a list of maybe four to five pharmaceutical classes. We can do hormone replacement therapy. We can do, you know, um, SSRIs and other psychiatric medications. And those tend to be a birth control pill. You know, that's kind of it. It's not like we have a rich pharmacopoeia to, to draw from. And a lot of folks may or may not get results from a pharmaceutical intervention that might not be where they wanna start. They might have some risk factors there. So I think it's a great time to add in this additional modality and and play with a little bit and see what works for you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you mentioned back a bit that I think relates to exactly what you're saying there, kind of this this curiosity, but then this like a communal um, space of medicine too, is that how, when we're talking about, are you using the root? Are you using the leaf? But I'm also wondering 
if it doesn't also matter when that plant is harvested and how it was grown. Yeah. So if we're thinking about like this, like really holistic perspective on medicine too, like who grew that herb? What were their farming practices? Like yeah. almost like when person to person harvested? medicine. Yeah. Yeah. So really get, you know, get to know your local botanist and herbalist, go to the farmer's market. I mean, it's a really way to kind of, for people who are interested to kind of get in touch with those cycles. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been a really great, like two season, two episode show too. I mean, there's so much information packed into these. Is there anything like any parting words that you want to leave um, women with, especially around the, the botanicals of like, this is, I would try this or like do your research here or. I think, you know, my, one of my biggest take home messages around perimenopause is that people don't have to suffer. And even though it might not be fun all the time, like we don't want to get into that, like positivity spin of like, you have to embrace everything and it's always great, but that you should look for solutions that work for you. And if the solutions you are being presented with haven't worked for you thus far, like keep looking. And that might look like making relationships with different providers, but it might look like inviting some experimentation on your own and some sort of research and educational experiences on your own and figuring out what works for you. So that would be sort of my take home message, which is just finding the solutions that work for you. And in my experience, botanical medicine is a lovely solution for a lot of the things that come along with perimenopause. And it's not an either or proposition. You can do the prescription medications and the herbs most of the time. You just got to double check for safety. But I think that's the other sort of black and white people, like black and white thinking people have around holistic medicine is either you do that or you do conventional but there's no in between. And I'm like, do both. Like pick, (laughs) pick and choose every tool that works for you and like put together your own personalized plan that gets you along your own personal spectrum of wellness to where you're sort of satisfied and want to be. Yeah. I think that's really, really well said and stay curious and stay reflective on how your experience is going and, um, and know that like, as someone goes through the whole journey of perimenopause, which can be sometimes up to 10 years, like there's going to be a lot of changes that happen during that. So be open to ebbing and flowing with these changes that come up and what the the tools that you used in early perimenopause, they may not be the same tools that you're going to need in later perimenopause. What works now might not work two years from now or five years from now or six months from now and being like, oh yeah, that was working. Now I need something different. And then having that sort of flexibility to change when you need to. Absolutely. Well, we will definitely put links to your podcast because I know you've got a lot of great conversations there. And for people that want to continue diving into these similar conversations that you you and I've had um, a couple of, and would you like to send anybody anywhere else on to learn more about your work or things that you offer for, for folks? Yeah, I mean, folks can check out my website, which is just drcaitlin.com. I have some sort of blogs and information there. And then if they want to sign up for my sporadic occasional <laughs> newsletter, you know, on a quarterly-ish basis, that's uh, probably a good way to kind of keep in touch with me as well. Perfect. And if you are listening to this and you're in the Colorado area, you're in the Denver area, that's where Dr. Caitlin's practice is too. So yeah, you can always go and find her there. So. Super. Thanks so much for being here. Wonderful to chat again. And we'll hopefully talk again soon. Awesome. Bye.